Hey there, David Mason from the movie A Tear in the Sky. I was the inventor and science and technology researcher and analyst in that expedition. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about is FLIR cameras. Um, now, to give you a background, my company, we contracted with a thermal camera manufacturer. So I understand this technology and also uh, have done electronic engineering within these cameras. I've done modifications. I even have an invention, which will be shown later at another time, of a thermal camera that I completely re-engineered to give it a new function. So I'm not a guy that's just talking about FLIR cameras. I'm a guy who knows how to engineer circuits within them. So I fully understand how they work from the long wave infrared entering it to the image processing to what comes out of that camera. So when this movie comes out, A Terror in the Sky, there's going to be some questions about the FLIR video. And many of these questions are going to be predicated upon the misconceptions about FLIR cameras. And I'm going to talk about those misconceptions so that when you watch these videos, you'll have a better understanding. Um, so the first misconception is that these thermal cameras can see through buildings. No, they cannot. That's Hollywood fiction. You can't see through buildings. I don't care who you talk to in a sense of outside of a thermal camera manufacturer. If you contact a manufacturer, they will explain it to you. You can't see through buildings. You can certainly see uh, heated wiring conduits, water conduits, uh, studs in the wall, water leaks, uh, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, air leaks, uh, those kinds of things can be seen. But people walking inside buildings, you cannot see them. So get that out of your head. Just, you know, purge it. And you can also cross-reference what I'm saying by contacting them. So the next uh, misconception is that thermal cameras can see color. No, they can't. Uh, they actually take what is a monochrome video or photo and they colorize it. And these are uh, colorization uh, platforms that are done for the purpose of enhancing your ability to see contrasts of different temperatures. So if you have an object that has a specific temperature and it has a specific apparent color, that color can, can be compared to the camera's calibrated temperature span. And you can get an accurate measurement of that object temperature based on its color when compared to the calibrated temperature span. And that calibrated temperature span can be set automatically or manually based on you know, your, your parameter settings. So that's what the color is. It's false color for the purpose of color um, identification of temperatures, making it easier for the user to readily identify temperatures. And so the next um, uh, misconception is concept of distance and temperature. And surprisingly, I've run into PhD physicists who think that you can't see temperatures beyond a, a certain distance and measure it with a, a thermal camera. And I tell them, look, you know, NASA has been imaging long wave infrared for decades, uh, even past long wave infrared. And it, you can quantify it. You can measure it at great distances to the greatest, you know, reaches of the known universe. So it's, there is no real limit um, based on, on the long wave infrared. Um, there's an attenuation factor from the Earth's atmosphere. If you're looking into outer space, there are these band gaps where there's high attenuation, low attenuation, and that can affect temperature measurements or, or just getting the data. But there, technically, there really is no limits other than atmosphere. And, uh, you know, you can take a low-cost thermal camera and point it at the moon and see the moon. And that's approximately 240,000 miles distance, so that's pretty far. And, and even get a measurement off that moon uh, surface won't be accurate because of the attenuation factors of the uh, atmosphere. But certainly, you can see great distances. So this is a um, very common misconception. Now, the, the next misconception is that FLIR emits some kind of radar. Uh, I've heard this going on, and it, no, it doesn't. Thermal cameras are passive. They just receive medium or long wave infrared into their imager and not transmitting anything. This may be getting confused with LIDAR, is my guess. Is maybe what, that's what's happening, is there's some confusion. But as far as 
the passive measurement devices that do video and stills do not transmit any data. Um, so uh, the next misconception is, I'd say, the, the brand name, FLIR. Now, FLIR is just an acronym, Forward Looking Infrared, and it's commonly used, and what's also used with it is thermal camera or medium wave IR, uh, medium wave infrared, or long wave infrared. That's um, really the identifiers. And FLIR is also a brand name. So uh, one company bought several thermal camera manufacturers and started manufacturing it under the name FLIR and innovated their own technology and, and really grew this thing into a, uh, a very big uh, corporation. And so the name is confusing and uh, people think that if it's FLIR, it has to be that particular manufacturer. There are several manufacturers of this technology and not just one uh, particular manufacturer. And so that, that's also a, a misnomer. Now also another misconception, thermal cameras can only measure heat and not cold temperatures. Well, this isn't true. You can take a low quality consumer grade thermal camera and, and look at a snow bank with it and see the snow. So it's actually quantitating it. And it, it may even have passive temperature measurement where you can measure the surface temperature of the snow. That is a cold temperature, not heat. And it's a form of long wave infrared. So don't get the concept uh, mixed that, oh, it, because of the name thermal camera, it confuses people. So we think that it, it can't measure cold temperatures. Many of these consumer grade cameras will go down to minus 40 Fahrenheit and some of the industrial grades will go below that temperature. So again, understand it's being misunderstood as a uh, technology. Um, so this is one of the big misconceptions. Now, another big misconception is the name FLIR is being thrown around. I see it all over. You know, somebody says, oh, we have FLIR. Well, what kind of FLIR? That's like saying, we have a camera. Is it your cell phone camera or is it some $100,000 studio camera? Big differences between the types of technologies. Now I can show you some cameras. Uh, here's a thermal camera. Uh, this camera retails today for about $3,100. It's a lot of money. It has a 320 by 240 imager, uh, so microbolometer. But look at the size of the lens. Look at how tiny that lens is. It's, it's pretty small. It, it has a small microbolometer. And so there's certain limits about what this camera can do. It'll do building inspections. It's great for that. It's great for search and rescue or Bigfoot hunting. Um, but when it comes to pointing this at the sky, expecting to record anomalous objects, the video frame rate isn't going to be satisfactory. And some of these cameras are being advertised falsely. Now, I'm not saying this particular brand. Uh, I've found that FLIR has actually been very honest about how they advertise their products. Um, but one of the couple of things that happen is some camera manufacturers will say, oh, we have 60 hertz frame rate. But the, the imager is actually being sampled at maybe 2 hertz or, or 7 hertz, at much slower frame rate, and they're just chopping it to uh, give you a video feed that looks like it's 60 cycles, but it isn't. And, and so what that means is if an object flies and transitions across the screen, you're going to have images that are smeared. A uh, bird will just look like a smudge and a blurry mess, and you won't be able to identify it. And that is inherent with the small lens cameras because you can't uh, get the quantum efficiency of, of the low energy from a um, long wave infrared. Long wave infrared is very low energy, especially as it gets colder. And this is where these cameras don't really quite do it for video, but they work excellent in other fields. Now, we have another camera. Now, this is a real camera. Look at the size of that lens. That has a massive microbolometer and a massive lens. This has great quantum efficiency. The microbolometer is large, the lens is large, it will collect more long wave infrared efficiently to the camera. 
And the advantage of this is quite a few advantages. You can get more accurate temperature measurements. You can get faster frame rates. This camera can do uh, 240 frames per second. I can set it for that, that rate. I typically run them at, uh, at 60 frames a second. And the other advantage of light cameras with these large lenses, this is what you want to look for in this UFO research, is to um, use this kind of lens to camera because that means it will be efficient and also capable of measuring cold temperatures, provided the firmware within that camera will range down to those cold temperatures. And I'm talking about lower than minus 40 Fahrenheit. And the um, capability of being able to fast frame cold objects is something that is not capable on, on some of these cameras with small lenses. And this is why this camera with the lens set was over $50,000. And, you know, a big price difference between this uh, $3,100 camera. And that's why the prices are different because of the performance differences. So when somebody says, oh, we have FLIR or we're going to buy FLIR, understand that you've got to know what type of technology you're buying and what to expect from it. And also another thing to talk about, and this comes back on uh, the consumer grade cameras. Some of these cameras, FLIR not being one of them, of this brand, are being advertised as having great resolution. And I saw one that had a 160 by two, uh, it was a 160 by 120 resolution. But the display resolution was 640 by 480. And so on the onset, when you look at the ad, you think, oh, wow, it's a 640 by 480 camera. No, that's the display. The imager was 160 by 120, way smaller. And that is intended to fool consumers and, and make them think that they're buying a high resolution camera when, in fact, they are not. So be cognizant of that and uh, understand that just do some research and know that if you want to look at this phenomenon that uh, it unfortunately is going to cost a lot of money to do it properly uh, and that's why we have these expensive cameras and these low-cost cameras and you can buy a low-cost camera and maybe see something with it um, but if that object's moving um, <laughs> it's it's not going to give you much data and oftentimes i think you're going to get blurry images and and people will start recording blurry images and thinking it's a ufo when it's probably a bug or a bird. So just keep that in mind. And uh, I'm going to be doing some more videos on uh, research of this kind of phenomenon and also further explaining in detail about the videos of FLIR object, of objects in FLIR that are um, anomalous and explaining why they're anomalous and how they're differentiated between the prosaic airplanes, air bugs, and aircraft that we all are familiar with. So I hope you um, uh, learned something and enjoyed this video, and uh, I look forward to doing some more presentations and helping people to figure out what kind of stuff they're going to need to do if they want to move forward and doing this kind of research. Uh, thanks for watching.